this goes way back to sort of some of the stuff we started at the, at the start of the unit. You remember I sort of said jump ahead to vectors that I had to come back? These are the couple things I have to come back to. Is it covered on Monday? Yes, it is. Okay? But it's not hard. It's just the philosophy of science, kind of one of those sort of, you know, big picture kind of thinking kind of things. Okay, so Bayesian thinking is named after the Reverend Robert Bayes. Uh, if you go on to study probability at university, you will uh, um, no doubt encounter Bayesian thinking, Bayesian probabilities. Um, interesting stuff. I'm just going to scratch the very surface of it for you. Okay? So two classic examples of Bayesian analysis come from World War II. The first one involves the statistician Abraham Walden. That's a picture of him there. Who was asked to determine where to add a limited amount of armor plating on bombers to protect them against anti aircraft fire? I think this more or less follows what you've got, right? Yes. Okay, so they asked this guy, he was a statistician, they said, Dr. Wald, I think he's a doctor, where should we? We've only got so much armor, we can't do everything on the plane. In fact, if we do, they'll be so heavy they won't fly. Where should we put the armor so that we get the best value for our, our money here, our best bang for our buck kind of thing, right? So, when a plane would prepare for the mission, the Air Force would record the location of all the bullet holes, and here's a picture of what I found online when I went and searched for that. There was plenty of data. Furthermore, there were clearly more hits in some parts of the planes than others. Okay, so like clearly there's hits here, hits here, and hits here, but for some reason right there missing, up front missing. Okay, so the answer is obvious, right? Put armor plating only where there was a high density bullet hole. Doesn't that make sense? Put the armor here. Why put armor there? Why put armor up there? Right or wrong? Are they right? How does it say no, they're wrong, or you don't know? Kind of both. Okay. <laughs> Obvious but wrong. There is a twist. Paul realized that he was only looking at data from planes that actually survived the mission. What happened to the ones that didn't survive? They crashed over Germany. Did we have data from them? No. We got good data from the planes that came back. So what? If there's holes here on the planes that came back, what does that mean? Survive. They can survive, exactly. Holes there make, don't do any don't make any difference. Holes here, holes there, as Keelan pointed out, are a problem. They don't survive, they don't come back. If you got a hole here, good chance the pilot's gonna be shot. Didn't come back. So do the opposite. These bullet holes didn't matter. You should be able to this down that little blank there. Is it a spot part? These bullet holes didn't matter. These planes survived with these holes. The planes that had holes in the other areas did not survive. And so the correct solution was... Where is it? To put armor where there were no bullet holes. Going against what was their first gut instinct. Probably goes against what you've always been taught, like game shows and whatnot, right? Just go with your gut. Let's go on to the next one. A second story relates to planning anti-aircraft guns and gunnery crews. I don't know, whatever reason, searching that, these are the only two classic examples I can find. Anything else is like crazy super hard. Okay, so, regrettably, they're both sort of airplane war based, but anyways. Second story relates to, uh, to placing of anti-aircraft guns and gunnery crews upon merchant ships to protect them against enemy bombers. So during the war, they would have merchant ships carrying supplies. Regular merchant ships means like you know commercial ships, no soldiers on them. They're tr uh, transporting cargo. So they were talking about putting anti-aircraft guns and gunnery crews aboard these commercial ships to protect them against enemy bombers. Since both the weapons and crew training were in scarce supply, they didn't have a lot of guns and they didn't have a lot of people that could shoot them. A handful of vessels were equipped to test the idea for several weeks. Okay, at the end of the trial period, the gunnery crews were asked, how many planes did they had they shot down? And the answer, unfortunately, was none. Didn't shoot anybody down. Didn't do anything. They just sat there, looked at the sky, ready to shoot, didn't do nothing. 
The plan was about to be scrapped because they didn't do nothing. Let someone else stop to ask a different question. How many of the ships were sunk by bombers that the gunnery crews were on? Guess what the answer is? <clears throat> None. Exactly. Good, good analogy. As it turned out, the answer was again none, which was much lower than would have been expected otherwise. The ships were being protected, but not shooting down any bombers. In fact, they probably could have done what? Much like the scarecrow right here that Jason's talking about. Did they need to put real guns and real shooting guys on there? Probably not. Fake guns and straw men. Might have worked. <laughs> Apparently, the enemy pilots did not enjoy flying through the tracer fire. Program was accepted. So they actually did actually fire something, but they probably could be lesser equipped. Similar to fake surveillance cameras, right? They don't record any crime, but they likely prevent it, or so the thinking goes, right? You can even buy them, like at Home Harbor, right? 20 bucks for a fake camera. Anyone fool by them, you think? Probably. probably. Yeah, it probably has some. Is that something you can figure out if they're successful or not? Like, how do you do that? How do you how do you prove something prevented something else from happening? I guess. Right? I mean, are that are the crimes going down on there? Right. Another one that comes to mind that sort of is along the same lines here is with the gun control debate going on in the United States. They talk about how everybody having a gun in their home prevents crimes from happening. Can you prove that? It's pretty tough to prove something with data of something not happening, isn't it? You can certainly see if it actually decreases crime, you know, with some baseline, but pretty tough now to sort of prove it. Okay. Now this one really has nothing to do with science or physics, but it's awfully fun and so let's play it. This, my friend, and because I used to teach applied math 40s and it was in there, I could spend quite a bit of time on it. I can't spend any years much time on it, but man, it's something you should know because it's cool. Suppose you're on a game show and you're given a choice of three doors. Monty Hall, by the way, was actually, this was a game show back in the 70s, East of Winnipeg. Do you have this in the back? Yeah. Okay. Behind one door is a car, behind the others are goats. Assuming that you don't want to win a goat, I don't know if you're about your preferences. You pick a door, say number one, and the host who knows what's behind the doors opens another door. Say number three, which has a goat. He always shows you goat. Then he says to you, do you want to pick door number two? Do you want to switch? Or do you want to stay? Okay, you got three doors. You pick one. He opens a different one. He always opens one that has goat because he knows better. Do you switch or do you stay or does it not make any difference at all? Okay, that's not very good. Okay. Then you pick a door. The middle one. Okay, now I haven't shown you the one. I've shown you a goat. Would you like to switch or do you want to stay with door number two? Come on, switch. Yeah, you go ahead. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm talking to you. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. No, no, no. Do you want to stick with the middle one? You're gonna switch. Okay. So I gotta go question mark. That's weird. It says click this to keep your first choice. So I'm about to change it. Well, I'll click this one here. Sorry, you kept the choice. You lose. You win a go. Yes, go ahead, Jason. Pick a door. Number one. Number one. There's the other goat, or there's a goat. Sorry. Do you want to stay or do you want to switch? I'll stay. You're gonna stay. Win a car. Go ahead. First one. <laughs> you can't. You have to pick one of those two. <laughs> Which one? Do you are you switching? Go. Does it matter? Is it 50-50, Joey? No. Does it matter? 
It's 50 50. Yeah, it is. Okay. I'm going to ask is, should, does it matter or not? Is it 50 50? Hands up. 50 50 doesn't matter. It's better to switch. Don't know. Both oh, hands up. Yeah, exactly. This actually math problem has um, has confused mathematicians for years and years and years. And people with way more degrees than me and people way smarter than me are still debating it. But the answer is pretty simple. Watch what happens. Now that we have computers, right? Okay, I'm going to run it a thousand times, and I'm always going to stay. I'm never going to switch. Is this going to work? Because it's not. Doesn't look like it's working. It didn't work. I don't know. I'm going to run. It. I, I'm going to do this. I'll do this. Multiple goats, yeah. You just won a thousand goats. <laughs> Let's see if I tried this all out on my laptop before. Oh, for crying out loud, it's got to be internet. Okay, we'll try it ten times and make sure that it. Okay, this one did work. I'm gonna run it a thousand times. Well, yeah, it always moves, right? Okay, we kept the choice. We never switched, and we won 34%, and we lost 66% of the time when we stayed. Let's let's switch now. Oh. If I switch, 65% of the time I won. Why is switching better? Because you have more probability to get it. I don't know. It's like, when you select it and the one that flips over, that's your 66% chance. So when you switch, it'll be the other percent. What do you think, Brandy? Same thing? Okay. Well, let me see if I can explain it here. I'm going to draw three doors, right? I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. Because this is just for fun. Like a okay. When if I ask you to pick a door, what are your chances of winning a car? Thirty-three percent. I think we all agree. One out of three, right? Guaranteed. No argument. Okay. Now if I say pick a door, right? And then I show you. I'm going to draw a pig because it's easier. Okay. <laughs> it's not. I should. Yeah, it's a donut. You win a donut, right? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so let's say you pick this one, right? But I show you this one. What is your chance if you switch now? Now you're only picking from two. So your chances of picking the winning one are? 50-50, one out of two. But if you stick with this one, you've already selected it, one out of three. Because you've already picked it. Do your chances change? Do your chances? If I did this, if I opened this one, and then drew the donut there again, are your chances now a hundred percent that you've won? Yeah. Well, yeah, they are, right? But it's still one in three at the start. I just open the doors in a certain order. Okay. But if you switch, you have a one in two chance. Picking the same one doesn't change your chances, right? You've already picked that one. As you can see, it's not easily understood, and yes, mathematicians have been debating it for you. So all this What a big picture of all this? Okay, go ahead. Did they? Yeah, they did. And what did they come up with? Pretty much the same thing as you can do. I mean, really, it's not that hard. Do it over and over and over again. Big picture, what have I been saying? Always Well, or what I'm saying is, don't always know your gut. Think it through, please. Think it through. Okay, let's go on to.